I know how you feel, the joy and heartbreak of friendship in women's lives. I am so excited to have Diane Barth on. She is a psychotherapist and psychoanalyst in private practice in New York City. She has a master's degree from Columbia University School of Social Work and an analytic certification from the Psychoanalytic Institute of the Postgrad Center. And the book just reads like such a joy, you know, once I get through this intro. Currently, she teaches... <laughs> private study groups and often runs workshops around the country. Ms. Barth's articles have been published in the Clinical Social Work Journal, Psychoanalytic Dialogue, Psychoanalytic Psychology, and other professional journals. I Know How You Feel, The Joy and Heartbreak of Friendship in Women's Lives is her new book. It's out just in time for Valentine's Day and um, Galentine's Day, whatever we're calling it. Welcome to Reading with Robin, Diane Barth. Thank you very much for having me. I'm so glad to have you, and I'm glad that that intro was over. <laughs> I'm excited it's, to be here, and I'm sorry that it's such a complicated intro. No, I should have practiced, Diane. I would have been better. But, no, I, it, it, all this is to say is that you are well-versed in all that you speak, and this book has been – I don't remember when it arrived, but I've poked through it. I've read little chapters and. Everything is so relatable, and this is the kind of book that I don't know if I want to give it to all my girlfriends, but I think I will be giving this out. I, I can imagine someone going, well, are we broken? What's going right, on? How exactly. do we feel? Exactly. But isn't this a great jumping off point? And I love that you were having coffee with a friend, and that's how the inspiration came. You can talk a little bit about that. Oh, sure. I was, I'm exactly what you said. I was having coffee with a friend and we were, we, this is a friend who I've known for years and we see each other sometimes more often and sometimes less often. And we, we just mentioned how, you know, every time we get together, it's like there's been no time between us. We can't stop talking. And, um, she said, have you noticed how your friendships have changed over the years? She said, you know, I have certain friends who have disappeared and certain friends who um, things have gotten more intense with and the friends who have gotten less intense with. And then, you know, I have friendships like ours where we see each other just every so often, but it stays very rich and very full. Anyway, and I said immediately that, yes, I knew that exactly what she was talking about and that it was very interesting. And she said, you should write about that. I bet other women are, are thinking about this, too. Yeah. And I knew from, from my work with clients that women's friendships, actually with my male clients also, but they're not quite as, not all of them are quite as um, free about talking about it as a topic in therapy, but, the, but that friendships are just a crucial part of our lives, and they don't always get addressed as, as having psychological meaning, but they do. They are such a part of our lives, starting from when we're, you know, little and talk about, um, well, there's, there's the friendships that we have certainly with our friends if we have children that are of the same age, but our own friendships. And, I mean, I can think back to my very first friend was a neighbor because as, as a child that's often the case. And so yeah. it's a geographic um, as consideration. A as a, as, yeah, as an adult. I'm from the drivers. I mean, and I relocated to Rhode Island 32 years ago. Yeah. Um, and so I remember moving here and people sort of don't drive very far. <laughs> and I don't mind going anywhere. So I have friends from all over and people will still be like, wait, you're going where? And I'm like, it's 20 <laughs> minutes away. It's 20 minutes away. Yeah. But, um, but in terms of really as a child, you know, those were the easiest friends to have, so we didn't need to be driven everywhere. And, you know, right. you had your neighborhood friends, and then if something happened or there was an implosion, you were ostracized in the neighborhood pretty much because where were you going for your, yes. for your friendship? Yes. You know, and then that develops on into school and, and where you have more common interests or that sort of thing. But the evolution of friendships is fascinating to me, and the friends that we choose to keep or, like you say, the friends that, you might not see all the time, but it's just as much of a connection. And when you sit down to talk, it just, you know, you feel like you've, well, you have known some of them forever, but you just feel like you've never even skipped a beat. And what do you say to, well, so you, and you talk to so many different people for this book. I found that really cool that you just, you say you're not particularly outgoing in that way, but you see a group of women talking and you would go over and introduce oh, yourself yeah. and... 
I yeah, how'd that go? a different person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> There's a mission like, for the book, was, right? Uh, exactly. But also, so my husband is much more outgoing than I am. So he would um, he would sometimes bring it up at a, at a when we were having at a dinner party and um, and and everybody, men and women at the uh, at a dinner party would all start to talk about it. Um, and uh, he would also do things like we'd be sitting in the airport, and he'd, he'd see two women sitting together. And he'd say, you know, my wife is writing a book about women's friendships. Would you like to talk to her? I love your husband. That's like my kind of guy. My hus- We sound like we're flipped. My husband would never do that. And I, as, as a reader and as someone who hosts a radio show, and you're tuned into Reading with Rob, and I'm on the phone with Diane Barth. We're talking about her brand-new book, I Know How You Feel, the joy and heartbreak of friendship in women's lives. I will go up to people and say, what are you reading? I see you're reading a book. That's my friend's book. Or, you know, I've handed out my bookmarks on the subway when I'm in the city or I, anyone. And if you're out there, you're open for business as far That's as I'm wonderful. Concerned. I have never <laughs> been like that. But I got to the point where I, was, I, I would stop people on the street. I, I love to it. The, the, um, the woman behind the counter, the florist, the woman who was doing my fingernails. You know, I don't get <laughs> manicures very often, but <laughs> when I did, I would start talking to her about her friends, which was actually very interesting because the women uh, who do nails in New York are often immigrants who, yeah. whose, whose friends become their family. Um, but, oh, yeah. So, so I, would, I would talk to anybody, and um, it, it became a joke in our family that somehow my husband's genes had passed into me. And I'm I not love afraid. that. Well, after all those years, sometimes, you know, whether we not like it or not, I'm like, wait, who, whose trait was that originally? <laughs> exactly. Uh, it exactly. does sort of yeah. morph. And, and it sounds like from all of the different women that you've spoken to, the commonalities would rise and – Right, you would think it, it didn't matter who you were really speaking to or where there they were, were coming it, from. It was fascinating. There were there were commonalities and there were also differences. And the differences were there were some cultural similarities mm-hmm. because even though I'm relatively shy, I have friends all over the world, and I would talk to them, and then they would connect me to somebody else, and they would connect me to somebody else. So I talked to people from a whole uh, range of cultures. Um, and also many, many cultures in the United States. And there were cultural differences and cultural similarities, which were not terribly surprising. What was amazing was the number of differences among people from the same kind of background. Oh, that that, is interesting. Yeah. I I talk a lot in the book about that we have – we have a myth about women's friendships, and, and for many women, the joy of a friendship is this long-term, uh, intimate uh, connectedness. Um, I, I, one, one story I love is a woman told me that her, um, her best friend, she no longer live in the same part of the country, but they, um, they talk to each other on the phone regularly, and they, they both have children, and they don't get to see each other as much as they like anymore. But when her children were little and she started traveling for work, or she went back to work and, ha- and had to travel, she called her friend and said, um, I'm getting ready to uh, leave for this trip, and I just want to make sure that you will promise that if something happens to I- me, <laughs> you will call my husband and make sure that he buys new clothes for the children Aww. every season of the year. Aww. And the friend said exactly what you just said. She said, oh, sweetie, you're just nervous about this trip, and it's okay. I promise I'll do it, but don't worry. You're going to be okay. And, and it was, it, so that was one of the beautiful stories of that kind of connection where, sure. you know, where a woman really knows what her friend feels and can respond to it, even though it's not what she's saying. Yeah. On the other hand, yeah. I talk to many, many women who have the kinds of friendships that are um, more like you were talking about um, in childhood, but that also are true in adulthood that are what they call in-context friendships, mm-hmm. um, which are friends at work, friends in the neighborhood, friends in a walking group, friends at, at yoga, um, who you don't really see in other situations, but they're part of your life. And um, it it turns out that those kinds of friendships are as important in our lives as uh, friendships that are um, uh, these long-term sort of mythical friends. And the sad thing was – 
Yes. Yeah, now I was going to say they could, yeah, because they can also serve different uh, needs exactly. that that you exactly. have. You know, yes. it's, you don't always want to get. There are people that I love to see where it's more like that for walk, a cup of coffee, or something yes. tangential, and you know you're not getting into like you can only get into the deep stuff sometimes or when exactly. you know someone has an appointment with you yes. <laughs> like, you know it right. you can and you can't do that with really good friends cuz they know there's something else going on so right. there's certain people right. you can only keep it light with at certain times right the, there's research that shows that that those what you're calling tangential friends or what they call friends in context are um uh as, uh, the, there's research that says that friends help keep us healthy, mm-hmm. and there's more research that says that the friends who help keep us healthy don't have to be these deep, intimate relationships. They can be friends that we walk with our friends in the neighborhood or, um, you know, casual friends. Um, Right, they but don't know, because you can only invest so much time in so many exactly. people at such, exactly. at such a depth, because then yeah. you really go nuts thinking yeah. that you're not being all things to all people and how many well, friends. exactly. That's one of the things that I found really sad is that so many women said to me, I'm not a very good friend. Yeah, I was reading that, yeah. Because they don't have those kinds of, you know, long-term friendships or they're not somebody who likes to go um, to uh, girls' weekend together or they or they just don't have time in their lives to... Um, connect with uh, their old friends. And what I found is that this is a really common part of, of um, women's lives, that there are times in our lives where we don't have time to connect. That doesn't make us a bad friend, and many, many friends understand that. Um, many, fact, many friends, friends don't. The same <laughs> this is true. This is true. So that, no, many, uh, many evolved women who have had therapy and understand their needs do understand this. <laughs> Can you tell there's some backstory here? Yeah, uh, one of the, I, I hear it. <laughs> right. One of the reasons that I was so drawn to this book is, is kind of specific for a few things and nothing unusual to be going through with, you know, different friends. And I'm someone who has many different types of friends and always sort of did different groups, different people. Um, yeah. And then, you know, it, sometimes it just could be like in high school. One group might think you're spending too much time with another group. and. Yeah. And you think, what else is going on in, in a friend's life that they're so yeah. invested in, in yours well, at the see, moment? You're so smart about that. A lot of times we <laughs> don't realize that it's something that's going on in their lives, and we feel like we've done something wrong. Well, I've done my work, Diane. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I'm kind of open to that, but no, I, I understand that, and I'm. And hey, I'm the last one to think it is me. Maybe it is, but I think that it's. What's interesting is sort of addressing that, or you know, you talk about you know friends sort of fading, and then this sense of ghosting, and then it's like you know people may come to realize, wait, what happened, or when did this start, or how far do we want to go back to figure out what went wrong, or do you just leave it alone? I mean, I don't know, owning up to something or or confronting a friend in that way. It's a really important um, topic. And one of the things that um, I loved, again, about gathering all of this information from all of these different women is that there's not one right solution to that. Mm-hmm. Um, that. That it really depends on who you are and who the friend is and what the history of your relationship is um, and whether you can, you know, w- whether you want to and can reach out, whether you can tolerate they're not getting back to you, mm-hmm. whether you can tolerate they're not getting back to you for a long period of time or a short period of time, um, and also, of course, what's going on. So one woman told me about, um, actually, this is a, a, one example, but many women told me about uh, a friend who was, um, was, who had, was periodically pretty depressed. Mm-hmm. And when she was depressed, she would just disappear. And right. some of her friends got furious with her because she she didn't she never said, "Oh, I'm depressed. I'm <laughs> going off the grid." She just <laughs> disappeared, and she didn't respond to emails, texts, phone calls, anything. Um, but this woman said, "You know, I I knew what was going on with her. I didn't like it, but I knew what was going on. So I would just send her a text every so often and say, "I love you. I'm thinking about you. I hope you feel better soon." And the yes. friend told her that that had meant the world, that it was it, she that she could not reach out, and that she felt like she didn't want any contact from the outside world, but that actually when this woman did send those texts, it just made her feel um, held and cared about. And and the other tricky thing, and you talk about the proliferation of social media, is 
say this friend who's sort of off the grid, God forbid, posts herself having, oh, I don't know, a smile somewhere, then there's that expectation of, well, she's not in touch with us, but there she is on social media. So, and how does social media certainly come into play and people measuring themselves up against everybody and their children and all of that anyway, and then how does friendship weave its way into that depiction? Well, in in so many different ways. I mean, so so social media in some ways just exaggerates what already was there for women mm-hmm. and women's friendships. Um, and one of the things that it totally plays into is is competition and envy, um, and and jealousy and and feelings that oh my goodness, this friend has two hundred and ninety seven <laughs> friends and I've only got six. <laughs> She must be, she's the popular girl and I'm the... Right, never ends. High school never is over. Yeah, Exactly. Um, And I heard many, many different stories about that. And one woman said, again, what I heard from several different people, but she put it really beautifully, which was that you have a a social media face and you have a real face. And that anybody who believes all of the stuff you put on social media doesn't really know you. So, um, so, but again, it takes a wise woman to be able to hold on to that knowledge and not feel inadequate or um, inferior or competitive uh, when, when we see all the good stuff that's happening to a friend. Well, you, t- you know, and you talk about that, certainly the feelings of being left out, jealousy, competition, all those things that are just at the base, you know, all I ever needed to know I learned in kindergarten or whichever book right. that was, right? <laughs> or in middle school, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, it's just like we played out and the cycles yeah. of our lives and our friendships. So it's just, uh, there's so much in here that is so fascinating. The book is called I Know How You Feel, The Joy and Heartbreak of Friendship in Women's Lives and Diane Barth is the author and she's on to talk to me about this and we have a couple of copies to give away so this will be posted on my Facebook pages uh, my Facebook page with all my friends and they can (laughs) comment below I'll put up a post and something fun about friendship and there are just you know this could be a conversation starter if there's somebody you know out there who's sort of feeling like I'm not sure what's going on with some of my friendships or this is what's going on with me. This might help explain. I always think a book is such a wonderful gift to give to a friend. And if this book is not a conversation starter, especially the book clubs love to read sometimes nonfiction, I I always suggest people mix it up and, and have some conversations. And often in a book club you'll get, they're not always necessarily best friends, certainly people who come together for the purpose of a book like you were saying or a walk or yoga or whatever so those friendships and those are really very necessary and meaningful friendships yeah. they may just meet once every other month or once yeah. a month or something like that because um, you talk about that in the book and yeah. like we were saying those types of friendships I mean what is it about that community that allows for a healthy discussion maybe different than a very intense relationship with a friend I think that it's, uh, so. It, uh, I <laughs> let me say that I don't really know because I was just thinking about a group that I heard about where the women got together as a reading group, mm-hmm. and they um, they were meeting once a month, and they they had met for years once a month. They didn't do any kind of outside socializing. They um, they enjoyed each other, but they really didn't. They didn't talk about themselves too much. But over the course of the years, um, one woman was widowed, another woman got quite ill, one, one of the members passed away, um, and even though they didn't talk about supposedly deeply personal things, they knew each other in ways that um, some of their friends did not know, and they were um, extremely supportive and caring with each other, but they also provided um, a kind of escape for each other, a way oh, of, interesting. Um, of not being sunk in the middle of uh, whatever it was that was really difficult in their lives. So they celebrated together and they mourned together, um, but in a very circumscribed way. And it, it, it was a very, oh, it still is, it's an ongoing group, but it's a very, very important group for these women. And that's so the I, thing, when, when you make it to these things, all of life's 
trials, tribulations, changes, moves, and all of this, and then still make that time for a group like that or whichever type of group. It really shows to the power of that group and why it's so meaningful. And everybody counts on everybody to be there. You know, it, yeah. it always can seem like, well, it's just you that's not there, right. which changes the dynamic tremendously. But if everybody sort of does that, then there's, <laughs> there's nobody there, you yeah. know, if you do the math. So, yeah, right, right. Um, you know, and people sort of hold each other accountable. And, and what did you find in the research and of women speaking to you when, a friendship was maybe more one-sided than on another on the other side and somebody needing more from the friendship at certain times than the other and how that is there an honest discussion about that or how does that work its way out yeah that over I, the long haul? I heard so many stories about how difficult that is and um, so one woman talked to me about how her um, very dear friend um, couldn't tolerate it when she, and many women talked about the difficulty of, of the change when they start to get married and have children. Uh, but one woman was telling me how her dear, dear friend couldn't tolerate that she was involved in her uh, new life with her new baby and um, would say to her, you don't have time for me. Uh, and, and she would say, you know, well, let's get together, but the baby will be with us. And we'd go for a walk with the baby. And the woman said, no, I don't wow. want to be around you with the baby. I want your attention. Uh, she was straight up about it, right? Mm. Um, but, but the woman who was telling me the story said that it just didn't work for her. She, 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 that wasn't where she was at, and she felt bad about it, but she also said it was, um, she felt angry that the, the other woman wasn't able to um, understand that she still cared about her, but she couldn't give her the kind of attention she had given her years before. And that friendship unfortunately ended. I, I, I would think, other, yeah. yeah, that's what I would, I I would think. Yeah, yeah. I and mean, there are I heard stories about women who's who were able to to um tough it out and figure out ways to handle that. But that but I think sometimes when one person just wants more than the other, um it can create agony for both women. But I think that the friendship doesn't often last. And that's the thing, you know, sometimes you do need to walk away from a friendship and sometimes yeah. there are friendships I know when the children are little and their friends, and then the mothers become friends because of that. Yeah. Then, tricky enough, the kids sometimes, well, often, become their own little people, darn children. They're not <laughs> those two- and three-year-olds that you can say, that. here's your best friend, and here right. they are. And right. here, share, share a little peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and you'll be best <laughs> friends forever. Although now, I guess you can't have peanut butter, but the idea. <laughs> Then they get older and they have little minds of their own. The mothers then sometimes stay friends or not, and then the competition ensues. And your friend, your kid did this to my kid, but yes. they don't say that. So then um, those friendships surviving outside of the children's friendships can also be an interesting dance. Yes, yes. And, and again, I heard many different stories about some of them, uh, the children grew completely apart, and the mm -hmm. mothers stayed very, very close friends. And some of them, the children stayed close, and the mothers mm, sort of ended their, I mean, just, just drifted apart. Yeah, um, it's interesting how that yeah. goes. And then yeah. sometimes they find their, their way back to each other. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very interesting the way that that can happen. That's another really interesting story I heard fairly frequently. It was the two women who disliked each other intensely in the beginning. Mm -hmm. And then for one reason or another were thrown together. The, uh, two of the women I talk about are, were, um, were in college and were uh, both sort of somewhat introverted and they one thought the other one was a snob and the other one thought yeah. the first one was too loud and out you know and abrasive <laughs> and um they got stuck in um the door well they didn't get stuck they both stayed in the dorm one night they were both um you know sort of um repairing themselves and they stayed in the dorm and they did whatever they were doing and they eventually wandered down to the common room to see who else was there and it happened to be the, each other uh-huh to their to their disappointment, of course. They each um, they started. You know, they were they weren't going to be rude, so they sort of politely talked to each other, 
and um, went out. They decided that there was nobody else to go out with, so they went out for a drink, <laughs> and they became very, very good friends. And they were two of the people who talked to me about how um, their differences were an important part of their friendship. That they and and the fact that they could tell one another that they were driving each other crazy. Well, that. honesty is is yes. um, right is. Yeah. often a rare but yet a beautiful thing. Yeah. And sometimes a person's differences, I think that can be very attractive, may force somebody out of their own yeah. comfort zone. Yeah. And if I were friends with so-and-so, I never would have, you know, pick a topic. Yeah. <laughs> some things exactly. a good idea, some things not a good idea, but right. open to experiences in any in either case. Um yeah. And, and what do you suggest, uh, before I let you go, to somebody who would like to either reach out to a friend or have more of an honest discussion? And how do you know, how would they know if it was, um, you know, if you're setting yourself up for, like, more than you bargained for? Or yeah. is it better to sometimes let things simmer and see how they pan out? Yeah. Or do you have to give it a little nudge? The answer is there's no single answer. And that That's actually, for me, that was one of the joys of this book, of writing it and of doing these interviews, was to find out that um, there are different solutions. And each person, I, I give a lot of d the different solutions that people yeah, found. Yeah. But one of the things that um, I think you have to do is you, you have to really think honestly about who you are and who they are. Um, I heard somebody just today um, said to me, uh, you know, sometimes friends tell you they want you to be honest, but they don't really mean it. <laughs> well, you have to know your friend well enough to know what honest means. It's like That's the definition right. of is. Exactly, yeah. exactly. But I think that one of the things is to really, you know, sometimes you have to take a chance. You cannot know ahead of time what's going to work and what's not going to work. Mm -hmm. so you have to think about what what you're feeling um, you need to do and what you imagine that particular friend is going to respond to, but be prepared for a surprise also. That's very good advice. And where's the best place for people to reach you? Is it on Facebook or on your website? Or uh, No, Facebook is not a great place. My website is a good place to, to uh, find me, which is dianebarth.net. Okay, dianebarth.net, and the book is called I Know How You Feel, The Joy and Heartbreak of Friendship in Women's Lives, and I suggest you buy it for yourself and buy it for a friend, and the conversations will ensue, and you're saying you're still hearing stories. I mean, you've reached out. I love that you did so much research and with people you knew, people you didn't know, and then out from there and people sharing it. Are you going to do a follow-up? What do you do with all the I, extra I stories? Know. I'm gathering so many stories. It feels like it, I should do something with them, but I have no idea what I can do with them. I'm, well, I'm in the still, meantime, you'll, actually, you'll gather I'm them. I'm still writing. But yeah, and I'm still gathering, yes. Uh, well, I, I think that there are, I mean, well, I, go, I always extrapolate it out to, you know, the weekends and the girlfriend things and the women's discussions. And I think storytelling is something that is, to me, so necessary, vital to healthy, balanced kind of world. And it just really understanding where somebody's coming from and being able to hear someone else's story related to your own or pass it along. And yes. there's so much of that in this book. It is a real treasure and a treat. Okay. And it's I Know How You Feel and Diane Barth. Visit our site at dianebarth.net. And we have two copies. They'll be up on the Reading with Robin Facebook page. And I want to thank you so much for your time and um, just so much to think about. Well, thank you, Robin. This was fun.